everyone and thank you for tuning in to today's episode of The Soul Call with Kelly B. I'm going to be introducing you to Emma Goodwin from Timeless Cookery. Now Emma is no ordinary cook. Emma has really been on quite a bit of a soul journey herself. She came from a place of suffering anxiety and depression in her past and kind of really being quite angry when she was young. And then she became a mother and her own children experienced things such as tics, Tourette's, night terrors and tumours. And through Emma's 10 years of coaching experience and deep diving into nutritional research, she trained as a GAPS coach. Now GAPS isn't something that I had heard of until today and it's all about gut and psychology and how they both connect. So it wasn't until Emma had walked this path herself and knew what it felt like not to have children who were as healthy as they could be, she wasn't feeling as healthy as she could be, that she turned her pain points into her passion. And so she's vowed over the years to keep things as simple as possible for busy parents who are exhausted as she was to try and crack the codes that are hidden within our foods because food is our medicine as well as laughter of course and there's plenty of that in this conversation but she has really discovered in her own journey that chronic diseases like eczema, asthma, juvenile arthritis, ADHD, autism, the list goes on and on These can all be supported and sometimes completely reversed by the correct nutrition. Emma has set up an online cookery school which gives everyone simple steps and gaps, principles and cooking techniques. And she does keep it really simple because she knows that we don't have time really to be spending hours and hours and hours as a slave in the kitchen. So the important takeaways from this conversation today is to really start to investigate the source of your symptoms. And that source, much of the time, is the fuel that you're putting into your body. And so I know that I've learned a lot from this conversation today. There are lots and lots of golden nuggets in this conversation. So get a pen and paper ready if you can, or come back and revisit all the free information that Emma has so generously shared here today. And if you would like to take a deeper dive into working with Emma and discovering food as medicine for yourself, there are several ways that you can dive into working with her, which she also shares in this conversation. So please check out our links down below. If you enjoy this episode, please leave a like, a comment, and please, if you can, share today's episode or any other episodes that you enjoy. If you would like to work with myself and I love to do energy healing and releasing negative emotions from the body for people and we touch on that topic as well in the conversation, then you'll find my links down below as well. Thank you for joining us and enjoy today's conversation. Welcome Emma, it's so wonderful to have you as a featured guest on The Soul Call with Kelly B and thank you also for offering to record for your YouTube channel here as well. Timeless Cookery, (laughs) you can find me on YouTube. Amazing, so what I'm going to do Emma is I'm going to use all your links, all your social media links and your website and I'll drop them down below, that's where people can find you and your work but What I'd love for you to share today, Emma, is all about your journey to where you've got to today. Because what we talk about here at The Soul Call is living, learning and leading with soul. And I work as a soul purpose coach and an ascension guide. And so there's nothing that brings me more and more joy than when I see people that have taken their pain or their difficulty and turned it into their pleasure and their passion. I just want to give a shout out before we hear about your story. I want to give a wee shout out to Kirsty Miller, mm. who featured on my podcast a few weeks ago. Kirsty is a very, very special soul who is a great connector of all these beautiful fractal lines that are out there doing lots and lots of good work. And Kirsty had reached out to me and said, You must get in touch with Emma and feature her on your podcast. 
And so here we are, we are connecting. So Emma, welcome. Would you, first of all, please introduce yourself for those of you that are tuning in and listening, you'll hear how this lovely lady has got to this beautiful point in her journey. Thank you so much. That's really kind of you. Thanks, Kelly, for having me. I'm very grateful. And thanks to the lovely Kirsty as well. Yeah, you were talking about turning pain into pleasure. You know, joy and pain, like sunshine and rain, we can't really have one without the other. And when you have been in pain, then when you do get better, it spurs you on to do things, doesn't it? It really moved me. I vowed I was going to make it supremely easy for anyone to follow the path that that I took as I dragged myself out of the gutter, basically. So yes, where did it all start? Um, you know, I suppose I woke up as a child. When I was little, I would wake up and have tummy ache. And my mama would always say, oh, you just need some breakfast, or you just need to go to the toilet, or you'll be okay, you know, and sure enough, it would pass and I'd get on with my day. But I was constipated as, as a little one, and I didn't even know it. Nobody told me that you're supposed to go every day. I had no idea. I thought two or three days, I was fine. That was normal. That's not normal. Two or three times a day, preferable, you know, but not to, if you don't go one day, then the toxins are just going to be building up in your in your system. So that was that was that. Then I went to drama school, I went to London and became an actress. And all that while I was a little bit anxious and depressed. But I was thinking, it's because I'm this age. And you know, but I got to about 28. And I just had a massive breakdown. It's that Saturn returns, isn't it? 28, every seven, four times seven years, cycles. And I cried and I cried and I cried like nonstop for about six months. I just, my, my eyes looked like burger buns. They were so swollen. <laughs> just anxious and depressed the whole time. I felt loveless, penniless, friendless, everything less. Even though I was acting, I was playing a doctor on a medical drama for a Granada TV, um, a, a regular in a medical drama. I was being paid really loads of money. And like, you know, I had a job, but I didn't realize it, but I was actually drug pushing for the pharmaceutical industry. Friday night, nine o'clock, when there were only four channels on the TV, there were like 20 million people watching. And we were introducing the concepts of IBS, you know, mm -hmm. which everyone knows about now. At the time, everyone's like, what's that? IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, you know. The storylines would be about two old biddies who'd been on holiday and got deli belly and then and then never got better. Anyway, everyone was laughing and joking about it. But I was miserable in that work, absolutely miserable. Anyway, I inadvertently fasted when I was depressed because basically every time I tried to put food in my mouth, I would dissolve into floods of tears and I got really skinny. But that fasting somehow made me better. I ended up having poison coming out of my eye and all sorts of horrible toxins coming out. I had a big detox inadvertently. Didn't know about the food as a medicine. So then um, I didn't want to be doing adverts for McDonald's two for the price of one or working for the police force doing adverts for them, which is what I was doing. And I just thought, crack, I wanted to do something else. So I became a decorative artist. So I retrained and I um, would use solvent based paints to create marbling and graining. I would do gilding on ceiling roses in posh houses in Notting Hill and paint people's baths to make them look like Verdi marble and things like that. Really good fun. And my badge of honor was that I would have white overalls and be covered in paint from head to foot, including on my skin. And I would scrub my brushes clean with white spirit and brush cleaner into the palm of my hand. So as you can imagine, <laughs> I completely poisoned myself mm -hmm. and I didn't realize, you know, I was also working with metal based pigments. So clouds of metal based pigments. You know, I was doing the inside of a fish and chip shop, painting metallic fish on the walls and things. And it was great fun, but <clears throat> I poisoned myself. And mm -hmm. then, of course, when I got pregnant, I passed the toxicity on to my kids. And this is something a lot of people don't realize because it's a generational thing. So if you're and your microbiome as well is, is passed on 
babies get their microbiome as they pass through the birth canal. So babies who, that are born by C-section don't get the benefit of, the, of maximizing the diversity by, by gathering the, the um, microbiome bugs via the vagina during birth. So anyway, I did manage to have two very lovely water birds at home, which I was really chuffed about because I didn't want to go anywhere near the hospital to have my kids. But, but then the trouble started because I wasn't very well in pregnancy and they weren't very well when they popped out and they were very colicky and cried a lot. And then we had ticks and bedwetting to a very old day, very late age. Um, we had night terrors. Um, and then Tourette's, my daughter had Tourette's, um, where she was shouting out swear words at the maths teacher. <laughs> it's, I'm laughing now because we're over it, but it, I was thinking, how is this girl gonna live her life? You know, I had sepsis pubis dysfunction and a lot of water retention. My legs were like the size of an elephant. Um, and again, depressed and anxious and not feeling good. So, <laughs> by some stroke of luck, you know, I chanced upon this um, interview with Dr. Natasha Calvin McBride, a Russian neurologist, surgeon, if you please, um, who was talking about the microbiome. And she said, here's my book, it's called Gaps. I went, right. You know, as I was reading that book, I just had tears rolling down my cheeks with relief because it explained the endless ear infections, the snotty noses, the miserable countenance, the, the family dynamic being antsy and angry and impatient and unkind. And it explained everything. I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is it. And the more I read about it, the more I got into it, the more I, was, I became possessed and obsessed and a little bit evangelical. And I was one of those mums, you know, at the, <laughs> at the, at the school gate who's like, um, yes, Baby would love to come to play, but she can't eat pizza, toast, bread, um, you know, crackers, cakes, uh, cereals, breakfast cereals are completely out. Um, dairy, pasteurized dairies off the menu. Uh, can't eat this, can't eat that. I mean, I did say what they could eat, which is sausage and egg and bacon and roast chicken and well cooked vegetables and lots of lovely, lots of lovely things. Um, but I could see the mums kind of giving me a bit of a cold shoulder. And I was thinking, God, I really need to make this accessible to people without sounding like some kind of, you know, preacher. Neurotic mother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Neurotic mother. Mm. But when you see how many poisons are out there, it's really hard to not shout about it, you know. So, yeah, yeah I implemented it. I did it by the book. I did it all wrong. I made loads of mistakes, but we tried. And then I wanted to become a GAPS practitioner, but they wouldn't let me because I don't have a nursing background or um some kind of medical degree that gives me the you know that gives me the, the the blue tick or whatever to be able to treat people but i do have so much enthusiasm and so much energy to offer uh luckily i bumped into dr natasha in person at groundswell it's actually for industrial farmers with big boys with their big toys talking about no till and not digging the soil, not ploughing the soil, but actually drilling the soil uh, without turning it upside down. It's a really interesting, um, this was in 2019, it was a really interesting conference. And I bumped into Dr. Natasha in person, I'm my guru. I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> Dr. Natasha, how are you? Can I buy you a cup of tea? And we sat there and had put butter in our tea. And um, she, I said, I really want to become a GAPS practitioner. And she said, well, look, you can't, but because they need to protect themselves, you know, if you're treating people with these illnesses and then it's not medical advice and all that jazz, you know, mm -hmm. but she said, don't worry, because next year we're going to start gaps coach training. You could do that. And I went, cool. That's what I'm going to do. So then even though I'd been teaching people since about 2014 in small groups at my house or other people's houses, I actually could have became a pro in 2019, 2020. And then I went because of the Corona nonsense, I went online. And now I'm reaching people all over the world with my GAPS app. Amazing. And, yeah, the message of the food. Oh, is what a journey, Emma. That's absolutely amazing. And we were having a brief discussion just before we press record today, just about how, for me, I talk about the silver lining in the COVID cloud. You know, it was an absolute 
you know, we'll just park that there as I often do, but <laughs> it has provided many of us the opportunity to take action, to change things, to become passionate about things again. And it really sounds to me like you have, even before, long before COVID struck, thankfully there were some of you who were leading the way before, you know, many of us, and showing us the way of, look, the food that you're consuming is toxic and the processes of food manufacturing is the whole sort of story as well and where the money goes and all of the ill intent behind a lot of that as well. So thank goodness that you have followed that calling for you. And I suppose it's been a really difficult journey at times because you've learned these lessons the hard way. Yeah. And isn't it amazing how you describing your story of, you know, started here, then I went here, then I discovered this, then my children were showing symptoms, and then I did the research, then I discovered gaps. Isn't it amazing how everything is such a beautiful, synchronised, divine order? We don't always understand what's going on at the time, yeah. but look where you've arrived. And Everything look, happens educated. for a reason. And yeah, I was miserable and depressed as the doctor on the medical drama, but the, that doing that medical drama taught me so much about the medical system and about the, the entertainment industry and the manipulation and the programming. <laughs> And then it gave me also this um, very feeling easy about speaking in public and being happy to show my face because I had the training as an actress. It's like who, I couldn't care less about that now, but I feel great that I feel confident yeah. enough to actually talk to people, you know, and get yeah. out there. Using those beautiful skills in, in a way that you wouldn't have ever had envisaged when exactly. you trained as an actress. Isn't that amazing? Exactly. But so, it has been a lonely journey. It's been a bit of a lonely ride because mm -hmm. nobody really wants to hear yeah. about, you know, Dr. Natasha's own journey started because her son was ha had a diagnosis of autism mm -hmm. and she was very pro vaccination. But then after his diagnosis, she said, oh, I see what's happened because he had damaged microbiome that affected him really adversely. So there is such a thing as damage caused by the childhood. Uh, thingies and mm -hmm. I've been talking about that for 15 years and getting mm -hmm. slammed down and um, so it's been lonely and I'm kind of I'm grateful almost for what's happening what's been yeah. happening so that people's eyes are opened it's sad mm -hmm. it's tragic but there are things we can do to mitigate the damage yeah, you know? absolutely and you know there are there are so many of us who like you're describing you know I'm thinking about my own journey here if I rewind back to when I was a child in primary school and everybody in our class was getting vaccinations, you know, topped up with this, that and the next thing. Obviously, you would have the, the childhood vaccinations, you know, your MMR when you were very wee as a baby, or some of us did. And then, you know, you would have your booster jags and our parents were thinking that they were doing the right thing for us. Of yeah. course they did. Yeah. They were well-intentioned and they were taking advice from the doctors, just like all the advice that comes through in the UK, the NHS, about what a good diet looks like. So you take on board all of that advice from a place of doing the right thing for yourself and your children. And I remember, I must have been about nine or ten and questioning one of the girls in my class because as we were all getting carted off in school to have our booster, whatever concoction it was at that time, she was left behind. And I asked her when I came back, I said, why, why are you not having your, your injection? And she said, oh, my mum and dad don't believe in any of that. And I remember being really intrigued because then it led into a conversation about how they only gave her natural therapies. So when we had a cough or a cold, you know, we were getting, I'll not name any brands, but like yeah. cough syrups, well-known ones, you know, off the shelves and things. And at that time, her mum and dad would seem really, like they were the only ones I had ever known growing up that weren't following the narrative. They were using flower essences, they were using natural homeopathic um, medicines. And so obviously at that age, I didn't have a full understanding 
of all of that, but I've reflected on that over the years because having worked in education for 22 years and seeing a massive decline in the what is considered to be a healthy diet, what is served up as school lunches, mm. <laughs> um, really, really shocking things. And then the constant, constant protocols of you need to get this vaccination, you need to get this one, you need to get this one. It's like, well, how many vaccinations must we have? Mm. But also over that time, seeing a, an absolute increase. I mean, I don't know the numbers, but I know from personal experience over my 22 year career, you would maybe have one or two children in a medium sized primary school who had a diagnosis of autism mm. to that becoming in a class, you would maybe have three or four children plus. I think in it's one in 35. Well, it's, more from your what you just said. Yeah, I mean, from my personal experience, I'm saying it's it's more from my personal experience. I don't know the national statistics or anything, but and then there are those children who aren't diagnosed, but you can see that there are symptoms mm. and it's a huge concern. It's a massive concern because it is so it should be for everyone. So it absolutely be. should. And what I became really, really disappointed with was we were talking about trauma in our children and we were talking about healthy foods, healthy diet, all of these kind of things, but we never actually spoke about preventing rather than curing. We never spoke about how to live a proper healthy lifestyle. But I think the tides are changing. Things are turning, Emma. And thanks to people like yourself who have continued to be those lone voices who haven't given up, who have kept continued to show up despite people not quite getting it and not quite being there with their understanding mm -hmm. of it all. And probably being used to a lot of criticism as well. You know, like, and, yeah. you know, being the odd mum at the school gate yeah. who, you know, oh, their kids don't eat this or they can't have that. I've seen that over the years, mm -hmm. so lots and lots and lots of times. And so I just want to honour you and thank you for leading and championing all of this because I've been late to the table with all of this. And had I, and I'm just going to say this publicly, had I had my time over again, I would have done things very differently. And I would never have had my children vaccinated. Um, the more that I look into this, the more I research, the more I learn. Um, there are many things I would have done very, very differently. So I would just like you to, first of all, share with us what GAPS is, Emma, because that was a very new term that I'd heard. And then I would love you to share a bit about your own personal experience. Feel comfortable to share what you want, you know, about the changes that that protocol has made to your life and then we'll start talking about your clients. GAPS stands for gut and psychology syndrome which is a big mouthful and it doesn't really sound very interesting but it's just basically talking about the undeniable connection between the brain and the gut. So like if you, you know if, if I opened up my skull right now like a cartoon you'd see an image of my brain with these sort of pink squishy lines going wriggling round, you know and then if i opened up my gut my belly at the same in the same sort of cartoonish fashion what would you see you'd see something that looks remarkably similar actually yeah. you know and when the fetus is forming in, in utero there'll be a little group of nerves and they string out to make a, make a, a little line with two nodules at either end which is basically your spine joining your brain and your gut it's like your gut is it's sort of your second brain yeah. so any kind of mental problems be that cognitive function memory loss um, adhd obsessive compulsive depression anxiety you name it you know bipolar schizophrenia any kind of mental imbalance a bad mood even say you're just like grumpy and you keep on getting angry and you don't know why it's going to be linked to the gut. I guarantee it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's all sorts of other side effects of your 
your gut being out of whack, your mineral balance will have gone off. So your electrolytes will be off, which leads to a whole host of your you know, cells just not working, functioning properly, which will manifest in a myriad of different ways for varying different, pe different people. But gut and psychology syndrome uh, was written 25 years ago, the book, and implemented by Dr. Natasha and helped her son to fully become fully functioning after a diagnosis of autism. So I'm taking that and using it to help anyone with any kind of um, problems really um, and it's basically really really simply it's real food that doesn't have a label you don't have to read any labels it's just food <laughs> it's all the meats it's you know the, the the beef the lamb the duck the goose it's poultry it's all the fish it's all the dairy the the butter the ghee the cream the the yogurt the whey the cream cheese but we ferment our dairy 24 hours so there's a way of preparing the foods and we often when we're healing and sealing the gut in the beginning using the stock pot so that's lick meats cooked in water so that's that it makes super bioavailable collagen gelatin amino acids for a broken gut and we use a lot of raw egg yolks in the beginning as well because that's like a superfood that needs no digesting whatsoever perfect baby food you know so we use very simple food preparations to just heal and seal the gut lining because mostly what's happening is that people are damaged by the poisons out there that we've just spoken about. You've just got to breathe these days and you're breathing in poisons, you know. Um, what happens is the integrity of the gut lining is compromised and it gets holes in it. And then it doesn't matter what you eat, even if it's beautiful biodynamic strawberry, whole pieces of undigested biodynamic strawberry are going to get into your bloodstream and then your blood, your body's going to go, what the hell's that? We need to get the, the Nina, Nina, send in the, you know, we need an inflammation. Inflammation starts. It's going to ma manifest in a myriad of ways. Everyone's got their different weak points, you know. But that's basically it. So GAPS is designed to heal and seal a leaky gut, ultimately nourish the body so the body can then detoxify itself. That's basically it. Yeah, what a great way to describe all Emma. And, you know, I know from just having a look at your Facebook page, you keep it so accessible and so meaningful for people as well, which I love. I mean, I'm sitting here today thinking, oh my goodness, I know I have leaky gut. How many people do you think have leaky gut Pema. I would guess it's well, quite a high percentage. You know what? They've been using glyphosate, which is a terrible, terrible toxin for decades now. Decades. Mm -hmm. It's in every it's in newborn babies, you know. And um that doesn't help at all. But then there's body, you know, products that we use that get in mm -hmm. through our skin. They don't help at all. Mm -hmm. I can't help but think that it's probably the majority between mm -hmm. 70 and 80 percent of people yeah. I'm imagining. Yeah. I know that I've made a lot of changes to our diet, but my inflammation is actually increasing. So yes. I'm definitely going to be seeking out a bit of support <laughs> from yourself after this beautiful conversation today. But for those people that maybe haven't heard of glyph glyph I was struggling glyphosate, to say glyphosate, glyphosate. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically weed killer, isn't it? And yeah, it's, it's called Roundup. All over our crops and yeah, yeah. It's it's known as Roundup. People can buy it from the Blooming Garden Centre to spray mm -hmm. on their dandelions. Dandelions are a food. We can make dandelion coffee. We can eat the leaves in salad. We can make wine out of the flowers or make cordials or whatever. You know, it's a beautiful superfood dandelion. We don't want to don't want to kill it. But people buy Roundup and. So that's just everyday people, but the big farmers use it in quantity, in mm -hmm. tons, thousands of tons of this stuff are sprayed all over England all, all the time. Yeah. People, municipal, you know, parks, park keepers, the golf course will be using glyphosate. The, um, you know, the street cleaners keeping the weeds out of the pavements will be spraying glyphosate on the streets where you walk home from school kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's a, absolutely true. it's banned in some countries i cannot work out why it's not banned here well like yeah. i've got an idea why it's not banned here but that's another yeah. story and it's very interesting because when you think about how many people nowadays ha have allergies and i've had myself two anaphylactic shocks Ooh, i've suffered yeah. from urticaria when i go out for a walk sometimes it I know that it's maybe not tree pollen season, but my eyes can be super sensitive. Yeah, you've definitely got leaky gut, babe. 
yeah. and actually you know all all you have to do is like lay off the grains which is easier said than done because it's yeah. a bit like an opiate <laughs> and it's a bit like drugs and it's like getting off the drugs and I understand yeah. that I really get it yeah. um off no 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 grains no starchy carbs so we also don't yeah. have much you know we don't have rice we don't have the faux grains like quinoa and you know buckwheat and that kind of thing uh, no veg oils, really, really, really important. Read the labels. Has it got sunflower oil in it? You're like, oh, sunflower oil. I like sunflowers. Sunflower oil will be fine. And no, it won't. Not unless it's cold pressed, extra virgin, which I doubt it will be. If it's been processed at all, it's become a trans fatty acid and it's going to kill you slowly. <laughs> but, you know, the other toxin that I mean, the last couple of years it's blown my mind. Um, finding out about naturally occurring toxins that are nothing to do with the industrial food system, um, which plants use to stop us eating too many of them. So seeds, nuts and seeds are full of this, lots of toxins like phytates, lectins, but oxalates are the big one mm -hmm. and oxalate toxicity is rife these days and I'm, yeah. I'm i'm so surprised that it, suddenly it seems to have come upon us um i've got i've got a feeling it's because our microbiome used to be much more biodiverse and then we used to have oxalate eating bacteria in our guts but i think the low level of antibiotics in the food system everyone's been dosed with antibiotics these days um, have just finished those bacteria off. So now every time we eat something with oxalates in it, it's just topping up the bucket. That might be one of your problems because lots of people think I better get healthy. I better have some green smoothies. I'm going to have a spinach smoothie. I'm going to just eat keto uh, foods, which is sweet potatoes and, you know, um, this, that and the other. A lot of those foods are really high oxalate. And then yeah. suddenly people have OD'd on the oxalates. So we've yeah. got to do a whole other protocol to help get the oxalates out and stop putting them in in the first place. Yeah. This information has all been really, really new for me. I had a recent guest on my podcast, Linda McClure, who has got Zen and is very similar to work to yourself, Emma. And she's an amazing soul as well and has been on a, a huge journey herself, healing her own gut biome and now turned her pain into her pleasure as well and her passion and her purpose and helping so many other people too. And it was really surprising to me to learn that seeds and nuts and some legumes actually can cause this oxidative or is it oxidative stress. I don't quite remember <laughs> Um, please keep me right but I thought oh my goodness you know until you know these things you, you only know what you know and she has done years of research as well it's these are the kind of things that when I worked in school we were not teaching our children because you only know what you know so you're taking on board you know the health board's advice the governmental advice and that's what you're teaching your children and it's the same for busy working families. We think yeah. we're doing the right thing with And you look at the you look at the food yes. pyramid that they show you. And really that food pyramid should be the other way. And the way that's it exactly be, what Linda says to you. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it incredible? So this for me is going to be a really exciting start of a personal journey for me. And I hope that many people that are listening in to this conversation today tuning into linda as well or other people you know reading books doing their own research come to a place of right let's change let's change the narrative because this is so important because what we're trying to do is prevent rather than cure because the nhs we keep hearing about how the nhs is overrun and they're stretched and you know i believe that it absolutely is but the system can't sustain itself and really it's time for us to take responsibility back into our own hands and where we can grow our own food and barter with each other rather than relying on supermarkets because let's face it I, I don't go to the supermarkets because I find them hugely depressing anyway. And now that I know the little that I do know what I have learned is when you look down the bread aisle, the biscuit aisle, it's everything, the cereal aisle, it's just full of processed. Yeah, I call it slave food. 
I call it slave food. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but I, I, I just think it just keeps you numb. Mm -hmm. It just keeps you a bit dim. It turns your light down a little bit like a dimmer yeah. switch, you know, yeah. and you, you, you don't know what it's like until you get off the opiates of the masses. Mm -hmm. And then you suddenly you wake up one morning and you're like, wow. I can really see clearly. I can hear things. I can retain information. I can use the power of my mind, the prodigious power of my mind, to imagine best possible outcomes rather than get, you know, spun into fear by the weapons of mass distraction that they're throwing at us yeah. all the time. Absolutely. It actually really helps you cope with the crazy days we're going through. It really helps you survive and thrive these troubled mm -hmm. times because it's okay. You know it's going to be okay. You touched on a little bit earlier about not just what we ingest, but, you know, what we put in our skin and things like that as well. And I'm currently taking some liver cleansing tablets. I knew that the liver was an important organ. <laughs> I didn't realise how important our organs really... It's the king, isn't it? The oh, liver, the king is your beta. Yeah, and again... You know, being a teacher, I knew that the liver was important and it'll, you know, flush toxins out. But we have to help our liver. And I think unless we know, I mean, I know I've got a fatty liver, I've got a benign tumour in my liver, it's very sluggish, and it's time for me to start really supporting my liver. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how, you know, every day we can support our liver to cleanse and clear. Because yeah. I'm now doing energy work, Emma, and, you know, I do what's called white flame healing. Um, I do something called silent counselling, and it works with acupressure and uh, connected conscious breathing. And so I was just working with a client earlier today, and we were supporting her liver to release anger because the liver can store, all the organs can store up negative emotions and of course tumors cysts all these kind of things are just hardened emotions that have been stuck there it's stagnant energy everything's energy yeah. what would you recommend to people to help a kind of sluggish because i believe a lot of people have sluggish livers and fatty livers yeah if what you kind of top tips would you give to people yeah well if you are angry that's a sure sign that your liver is tops up or tanks up or needs a bit of help for sure and i i spent most of my 20s scowling just like that you know i'd get wolf whistles and i'd turn around and scowl at them and they'd, they'd say cheer up love it might never happen i'd be like oh, i was mis i was so angry so miserable in my 20s anyway yeah liver so there's a few things there's lots of things we can do one is eat liver right <laughs> support the liver eat liver let's make some chicken liver pate Let's get some beef liver. Let's put the beef liver in the freezer. Let's freeze it and then chop it into thin slices and then make little tiny liver pills and refreeze them and then just neck a few of those every day. I don't even wow. bother freezing them anymore. I just eat raw liver, raw beef liver with a little bit of honey. It's very nice. It's, it's not a particularly nice thing to eat. I chop it into little pieces. I coat the spoon with honey and I just eat raw beef liver. With, and as you pull the spoon out of your mouth, you just get that little sweetness. And then you just knock it back with an eggnog or something. Wow. That's an excellent way to support your liver. Um, you can also use castor oil packs. Mm, castor you've got oil. one of those. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful stuff. It actually brings light into the body. I don't know how they measure that, but castor oil brings light into the body. Sunbathing, relaxing, really, really good for your liver. Hot salt baths to help get toxins out of your skin so that that's not going to have so much of a burden on the liver. The other really amazing thing you can do is, well, stop eating starchy carbs because fatty liver is all about starchy carbs. Like you can eat as much fat as you like. I mean, tallow, lard, beef dripping, you know, um, goose fat, butter, cultured cream. You can have as much fat as you like. It's not going to, that will make your fatty liver better. Right. But eat, this, is, eat. this point here is just going to blow people's minds, isn't it? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. it's contrary to everything. Yeah. All the advice that's out there. It's the processed um, grains that are contributing to uh, fatty liver. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You can have raw honey on gaps, right? But we don't have any other sugars. You can have some raw honey. You don't need much. And after a while, the taste buds change and you're just like, oh my God, that's too sweet. I can't handle it. 
we can make cakes and all sorts of lovely fat bomb frosting, date paste, all sorts of lovely things. You can have the sweet things, but it's got to be the right sugar and the right fat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, the other thing you can do to support your liver is enemas. It's not going to be a popular. <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't be a popular some... subject. <laughs> I've had a colonic irrigation once many okay. years ago. But... That's pretty heavy duty, a colonic. Mm-hmm. You know, it's pretty heavy duty. It's pretty, it wipes you out. But at home, we can practice home enema um, uh, protocols, which are simple, quick, easy. When I say quick, you need to get an hour to yourself in the bathroom. I usually run the bath, actually. or will put some Epsom salts in there, light a candle, put my favorite podcast on with some nice, relaxing music. And then once you're used to doing water enemas, which is basically like, it's basically like washing out your mouth and then spitting it out, but the other end, all right? You, you're mm. going into the colon in with a tiny little tube that's no bigger than a biro. It's, it's pa- painless, really easy, especially if you're constipated. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to do. It's so relieving. It clears the toxins out quicker than anything. And then once you're used to doing a water enema, you can then do a coffee enema. Now, coffee enemas are the bee's knees. I quite often have a, a coffee and cream enema. A coffee and cream. <laughs> <laughs> With cultured cream. And the corn. <laughs> yeah. And I get a lovely little high from it. I do it in the morning. I can't drink coffee. I, I, I suppose I could drink coffee these days, but I don't want to. I haven't drunk coffee for 20 years. Couldn't do it when I was pregnant. Gave me the shakes. And um, it's just too much for my adrenals. Um, I suppose I could drink coffee. I love the smell of it. Just love the smell of coffee. I'd love to be able to enjoy it. I have dandelion coffee now, which is also a good liver cleanse. Dandelion coffee. That's the roasted root. So yeah, a a coffee enema, when the caffeine hits the blood vessels around the colon, it's got a direct route to the liver. And the caffeine hits the liver and starts the liver slightly uh, spasming, which is, it also dilates the blood vessels and the vessels within the, the liver and, and helps to, to, to just squeeze out those little stones or those little, it's basically debris from parasites, from bits of rubbish, from oxalate crystals or whatever that have been wrapped in cholesterol. So they're making, your body wraps things in cholesterol. If it's dangerous, if it's toxic, if it's sharp, like oxalate crystals, they're like shards of glass, your body will wrap it in cholesterol, which is why the insides of people's blood vessels are all clogged up with cholesterol because basically there's so many toxins flying around their blood. It's mm-hmm. scraping up literally like sandpaper, the inside of their blood vessels and their body's going, Nina, Nina, put a plaster mm-hmm. on it with mm-hmm. some cholesterol. That's why the, the blood vessels are full up of cholesterol. It's, it's nothing to do with fat eating. I'll tell you that now. Mm-hmm. It's to do with how many toxins are flying around your system. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, a coffee enema is a great way to just help the liver to, to let go of some of those toxins. which will, And then it's a good idea to, to take some kind of mineral drink, like mm-hmm. a lemon and honey with some sea salt in it or something, or um, a cup of stock or something, um, because it's very easy to get demineralized from taking an enema. And the other thing you want to probably do is neck some kind of clay, like zeolite or bentonite or some diatomaceous earth or maybe charcoal but not if you're prone to constipation um, to mop up those toxins that will go from the liver straight to the colon back again via a slightly different route but the the liver will excrete those toxins back into the colon then you're going to wash it out and any any that are left you want to bind them with a binder which is basically like a bouncer who's escorting the criminals off (laughs) <laughs> off the premises yeah <laughs> yeah wow yeah oh there's lots we can do yeah this sounds absolutely amazing some of this I've heard before Emma but it's really hitting home with me today and I know that you know there'll be so many people watching and listening to this on my podcast and maybe your viewers are a wee bit further down the road than I am <laughs> with some of this but it's just blown my mind how simple this is to really yeah. take responsibility, to really help to look after ourselves. So this is inspiring me, can I tell you, to really press reset and say, right, let's take some action. You know, going forward, right. let's take some action right. Be- before it's too late. You yeah. know, before we have 
a state of dis-ease in the body. Yes. We want to bring the body back into ease. This is what I'm saying. You know, you've got your body sending you some little messages here. You're like, okay, I've got a little benign tumour. There's a lump of something. Your body needs to break it down. Castor oil is going to be very good for that, to break yeah, it down. Yeah. You know, um, th these little messages from the body are not to be ignored. Like even if you've got fungal toenails or you've got warts on your hand or something like that, or you just got like, it feels like you stubbed your toe, but you didn't. That's the myelin sheaths breaking down in your nervous system. It's a neurological issue that actually, I mean, if you went to the, if you went to the neuro, neurologist and went, it feels like I've stubbed my toe, but I haven't, they'd just laugh in your face, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and say, well, don't yeah. worry about it. It'd be all right. But actually that's a message. Yes, so let's yeah. do something about it now while you've got little messages that are just like, oh, okay, thank you, body, for telling me that. You know, yeah. if you've got white flecks in your nails, that's a mineral imbalance, a really, yeah. actually pretty bad mineral imbalance between zinc and copper. Yeah. So let's look at that yeah. and do something about yeah. it. You know, Before now. you're he's screaming at you, yeah, exactly. because it's a divine communication system. And this is what I say to my clients, your body's working with you all the time. It wants to keep you in wholeness. It wants to keep you safe. Yes. And so when you get these little signs and these niggles, it's communicating something to you. And when what I say to my clients as well is once it's hit the density of the body, because everything's energy, it's already quite advanced. Mm -hmm. So we may have missed it at the spiritual level, the mental and the emotional. And then when it comes into the physical matter of the body, it's already you really need to that's the alarm bells really yeah. when it's communicating something absolutely and the biggest alarm bell for me is when kids just want to eat beige food and they say oh they're a bit of a picky eater they're a bit of yes. a fussy eater it's like no uh, you yeah. should be like wah, wah, wah. alarm yeah. bells ringing yeah. loud and yeah. there's something you can do it's okay yeah. don't worry about it but let's do something you know? yeah what you touched on as well, Emma, is the generational things. So some of the work that I do with the quantum healing technologies that, as I describe it, that I use is, and what I've learned is that it can absolutely be carried down mm -hmm. generationally. So again, I was just talking to a client about this this morning, that one particular client that I'm working with has real health anxiety, she describes it, because as soon as she hears the word disease, so our doctors have said to her she has inflammatory bowel disease. And so as soon as we hear that disease word, she just spins off into like she's hugely triggered because what she's starting to connect with is, oh, well, my mum had this kind of disease, my dad had this kind of disease, my grandparents had those kind of diseases, and we think worst case scenario. And so what I was explaining to her is that disease is this ease when the body is out of harmony and balance. And I'm not a doctor and I'm not profess to give medical advice to anybody, but what I know about energy is that even before she was born, because we went back into when she was in utero, when she was in the womb, and what had been passed down energetically from her mum through the cells, through no fault of her mum's own, was a lot of trauma. And so that trauma then was held within her cells even before she was born. And so what we've been releasing energetically is a lot of the negative emotions, a lot of the trauma, and just supporting her body to come back into a state of ease and harmony. But obviously there's a whole aspect of this where we also need to be thinking about, we've been talking about toxic stress and everything's energy. So what we consume, what we eat and drink, we have to be thinking about, is this toxin free? Is it is it good fuel that I'm putting into my body because everything then we can do all this energy healing work but if we're still eating shit <laughs> you know mm. it's not going to help kind of undoing, it's not going to help it's yeah. not going to help so the generational thing and you know coming coming back to all that happens within the womb and this isn't for mothers especially to feel bad about you know um this is all working at the subconscious level we don't have a conscious awareness of these emotions being transferred through the cells what would you say to that emma so when you have a child and you have some you know significant experience of this where your own children had adverse symptoms of the toxicity that 
you were holding on to, you know, cleaning paintbrushes and things of your bare hands. We don't know these things at the time, but we've learned it through time. So your children have been exposed to toxins. My children were certainly exposed to toxins. I had them vaccinated and all of the rest of it. So how important is it for us to know and understand this, but then what can we do about it? Such an interesting question. Um, my daughter has a, a, what looks like the beginning of a bunion on her left big toe in exactly the same place that my mother has one. And I'm often giving my mum a, a hot salt foot bath and, um, you know, helping her with her feet. And she's got this big bunion, my mum. And my daughter has one in exactly the same place. Occasionally, my foot looks a little bit red on that spot. And I'm like, where has that come from? Yeah. I think she stubbed her toe as a child and her dad would not let her go to the World Fair in 1950 something. It wow. was a really big deal, a really big event. She denies it utterly. She's like, I'd stubbed my toe, I had to wear plimsolls and he wouldn't let me wear plimsolls because that's common. I needed to wear posh shoes to go to the World Fair so I didn't get to go. I, I think that's fascinating. Anyway, my mum obviously hasn't overcome it. And, um, my daughter's working on it. I think I might have broken the mould. I'm not sure whether I've managed to, you know, you're talking about emotions, emotional trauma that's carried on to the generations. Mm -hmm. I think I 100% think that's a thing, 100%. Mm -hmm. But um, we are capable of breaking the mould. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as a mother, when I started to speak to my little ones and, and be with them, devoted as I was, I was still repeating learned uh, programming and mm -hmm. phrases and things. And I was saying the same kind of things that my mum and dad had said to me, because it's what I learned. Mm -hmm. But luckily I was conscious enough to see the effect it had on them when I just, you know, just regurgitated these phrases. I saw the effect on the kids and went, oh, God, I can't, I can't do that. I can't say that. I don't, I don't want them to freeze like that. I don't want them to tense up like that when I say that. It's like, I can't even raise my voice with them. They're far too sensitive. They're far too gentle and sensitive. I, I, I've just got to be really super, super gentle, which was really hard, remember, because I was angry and I'm an Aries. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm an Aries ruled by Mars, God of War. And I'm also <laughs> a, awakened, which means I've got, I'm holding some serious <laughs> anger towards yeah. the so-called authorities, yeah. you know, and yeah. I don't want my kids to see me like that. You know, yeah. you need to reach a place of courage first yeah. where you can observe the horror and the terror and all, all the bad things that seem to be happening with a sort of dispassionate, unemotional, detached kind of neutrality, which sounds really ridiculous and hard. It sounds like a hard thing to do. And it also makes people think that you're somehow not compassionate or that you don't care. Mm -hmm. But actually, by not raising, not rising to the bait with all of these weapons of mass distraction and, you know, by all of the horror and the terror, by not rising to the bait, you remain in a stable state emotionally. Mm -hmm. Then you can start to observe, um, make, make slight changes, be kind to yourself. Also, if you're not in a tiz emotionally, then you can think straight. Yeah. You can focus you can rationalize you can um have this neutral acceptance um which which leads which spirals you up and out and mm -hmm. away from the grief the sorrow the frustration the anger the you know all of these negative emotions which literally eat you up yeah so those negative emotions just eat you up so i do. I, I do work with my clients with them um, a lot of I use EFT I use emotional freedom technique I use tapping mm -hmm. it's a really useful tool for me to um, as we're rebuilding the neural pathways with things like multiple sclerosis and you know um, polymyalgia and fibromyalgia and things as we're rebuilding physically the neural pathways with the food as the medicine then we are rebuilding the neural pathways with the thinking as well at the same time right. yeah. yeah i love i love all of what you've said there emma because i talk about staying in zero point in your heart so you don't get pulled out of your heart yeah 
And that's really difficult. It's it's learning to stay stable in that place and not being pulled into challenge, into war. And I think with everything you've got going on astrologically, I take my heart off to yeah. you that you're able to stay there. <laughs> it's what I call spiritual maturity. It's, it's stepping forward into that place of remaining neutral and I used to worry that I had that a lot of the time other times I do get triggered of not you used to worry about being neutral yeah. Yeah. yeah you know like not feeling into all of the drama all of the time and people think you don't I, care and people are like what's the matter with you why aren't you getting upset it's like yeah. I'm just watching yeah. right? I'm and not going to get upset because that's just going to eat me up so we're, right. we're a waste of my energy we that's can't right. afford to waste any more energy right? that's right yeah. Absolutely. I totally get what you're saying. And, you know, I've, I've learned how important that is over the years to stay in zero point of your heart, not to get pulled out, but to almost like be an observer. You know, you can be all of the world without being in all of the dramas and all of the challenges. Mm -hmm. And from that place, then you make your best decisions because you're not in that heightened state of reactory reactions you're coming from a place of right I can take a mature step forward here and take some responsibility for myself here yeah and the other thing it stops us doing is the finger pointing and the blaming so this conversation for example could have been really different we could have been talking about those governments and what they've done to us and we could have been really angry and to be honest I have been there you know I've, I've I've been there, I've been super triggered by things that I've learned, but I've, I've hopefully matured beyond that point to where now I can see it without still engaging in the anger and the outrage about all of this and say, actually, rather than pointing the finger of blame, let's now take the learning that I've got and take some responsibility into my own hands here. I had a Greek lover when I was in my 20s. My dad called him my ancient Greek because he was in his 40s. But we sailed the Greek islands together on this wooden <laughs> sloop. It was just idyllic <laughs> and heavenly. But he always used to say to me, Vreyata, when you were to point one finger at someone, you have three finger point back at you. And it's true. It's so if you good. start pointing fingers, and that's exactly what the so-called authorities encourage us to do all the yes. time. Blame somebody else and point yes. fingers and also feel ashamed and shameful and guilt-ridden mm -hmm. about things that are outside of our control, frankly. Yes. You know, I'm so I, yeah. I think our one responsibility is to, it's, it's not selfish, right, but to look after number one take responsibility yes. for yes. yourself right so 100%. that then you are strong enough and you've got enough compassion and composure to be able to deal with anything that comes at you despite the horror and the terror and then you're able to help other people yeah. and so it's a catch-22 isn't it whether do you start with the food or do you start with the emotional trauma or i don't care where you start just start somewhere just start somewhere <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and i so agree with that i you know in the Obviously, you can hear I'm Scottish and growing up culturally, you know, to love yourself was, that was conceited or, you know, that's selfish or who does she think she is? And all of those sort of silly societal, cultural beliefs that programming has gone around. And I've had to unlearn all of that and say, yeah. actually, my biggest responsibility is to me. And it's taken me 40 plus years to actually start to love myself yeah. and to be okay with that. And That's the key. That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. So I say to my clients, when the plane's coming down, you know, they tell you to put your oxygen mask on first before that's you help true. the babies, right? So that, that self-love is yeah. just the absolute key to everything. Absolutely. Selfish. Absolutely. One of my coaches has always said that you know your cup shouldn't just be full it should be overflowing and everybody gets to sip then from your saucer because if you are topped up and full and everybody gets the best of you it's beautiful That's yeah lovely. and especially as a pain we know <laughs> how draining it can be yeah, if, if, if you, you want if you want the best out of your kids you better start being an example you know yeah. if you're like looking at your kids and going whoa their behavior's a bit off 
don't be pointing the finger at them because you've yeah. got three points in back at you. <laughs> exactly. And like, you know, start to be the change. You be the change and they'll see the change and you'll have more time for them. You'll have more patience. You'll have more kindness because you'll be topped up. You know, your, your anger will have dissipated because you won't be hangry. You won't yeah. be poisoned. And then you'll, I remember my mum coming home and saying, I'm on a special diet and I've got cottage cheese and poached eggs. And we were all like, can we have some? And she was like, no, this is my special diet food. See, when you're eating something that's lovely and lush, that's special for you, your kids will want to eat it. Believe me. Um, that might sound like, a, 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 you'll be like, never. My kids will never eat that because they're just eating Pringles and blah all day long. And it's like, who's buying the Pringles? Exactly. Okay. We've got, to take, we've got to take responsibility. It's a tough cookie, but we can crack it. Yeah. It's okay. We can yeah. do it. Emma, before we wrap up this conversation, would you share with us how people can find you and how they, the different ways they can work with you? Okay. So I've got an Instagram channel that I try and make it light and a bit silly and fun because, you know, when you're dying of a disease and you feel terrible, laughter is absolutely the best medicine. And I refuse to be all kind of maudlin and serious about these life and death. It's his life mm-hmm. or death. And I'm not denying that, mm-hmm. but I'm having a laugh, right? As I die, we're all going to die. I'm going to die really well. I'm going to choose to die well. So I'm going to have a laugh before I go, right? So that's my Instagram, which should kind of entertain a little, I hope. Then I've got a YouTube channel where I do some interesting interviews and I'll be posting this in there. That's nice. And um, I look at, yeah, lots of subjects in there. And I have rants about the state of the world and, and my view on it. And then um, I'm, my Facebook is just Emma Goodwin because there's a ghost in the machine on the Timeless Cookery page, so don't go there. And um, my website is timelesscookery.com. And there you'll sort of see a description of the things we've been talking about today. And people can either join my group, which is a £33 a month subscription, where you'll gain access to an app, the Gaps app, which has all cookery demos and little short how-to videos. And you, you'll also join the support group, which is unfortunately is on Facebook at the moment, fast book as I call it. Um, but one day I'll be free from them. <laughs> and, and I also do one-to-one coaching, which is a monthly subscription of 240 pounds, which means you get an expert in your pocket because we're on WhatsApp and we can just talk all day long messaging you know sending pictures it's a useful really um, amazing it, amazing I'm doing some great work with uh, and i do retreats as well in normandy in france the land of milk and honey wow where people can come and stay with me for a week or two depending i just had a lady with bulimia and nervosa come and stay with me for she was there for three weeks in the end now, um, I saw her testimony on your okay. Facebook page, Emma. Okay. How amazing. Do you just want to quickly share a little bit about yeah, I mean, with you? I have never done anything like that before, but I have read the book, right? So I knew that Dr. Natasha had a protocol for people who are effectively starving, mm-hmm. the people with a food addiction or these, you know, bulimia nervosa is when you eat a lot of food and then you sick it up. And she was doing that maybe three, four times a day sometimes, Mm -hmm. spending a lot of money on food that was not actually nourishing her. It was all going down the bin. She was a croissant connoisseur. She lived in Paris and would go around the boulangerie spending a lot of money on cakes and pastries. Anyway, um, she said, I want to work with you. I said, I've never done it before, but I'm, if you want to do it, I will try. Come on. And we did just liquids for the first four days gaps gaps foods stock kvass eggnog that's kefir milk kefir fermented 24 hours with raw egg yolks a little bit of honey and we basically did natasha's protocol which was to load her up with amino acids like they were going out of fashion every hour she drank something and there was never anything to come up because she never had a full stomach but she drank something every hour for the you know and we did a lot of work on tap with the tapping with the i said to her just tell me everything that's going on in your mind and she got a massive rash and all the skin fell off her neck and i think that was because it's the first time she felt able to actually express herself fully at all times now she was admitting she was being sneaky and she said i had a binge when you went out of the room emma i'm like okay how do you feel you know what did you eat? She said about that much cheese and two bits of salami. I was like, okay, and how do you feel? Do you, do you feel like you want to stick it up? No. I was like, cool, well, let's call that a mini binge. 
and that's great because I want you to eat that food. So that's cool. Good work. Now go and write it down in your journal. So she just wrote this whole massive journal, thick journal over those two, three weeks and um, filled it up full of tools. She's got lots of tools to work with now, you know? Amazing. Yeah. So she, no binging, no purging for three weeks after wow. 12 years. Wow, yeah, her testimony smart. speaks for itself. She yeah. is just so delighted, isn't she? She's yeah. just beyond. I think she's surprised, isn't she? Because yeah. she wants to have a baby, you know, but she doesn't. She hasn't had a period for a few years now, so she. But that's going to come back because she's going to nourish her body from the inside out, like she said. Yeah, yeah it's a remarkable Amazing. protocol. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, Emma, this conversation has just been so enlightening. It's been so informative. I just love your energy <sighs> as well. And you just are doing such amazing work to support humanity, to support your people. So thank you for everything that you do, for all that you are, for being so... You know, I was just listening earlier today about... I can't even remember who it was that I was listening to. It was a podcast now listen to podcasts all the time now that I have one and um, somebody was talking about you know what leadership is going to be in the future and it's about integrity it's about realness and you encompass that so beautifully you know? I would love to be in charge of food and farming and health I tell you <laughs> I would, I would, love, I would love to work in that job <laughs> you know, I've got so many ideas. I'm imagining little gaps, cottage hospitals in every village, every town, every, you know, district of every city. Um, yeah, I'm imagining gaps, place, meals on wheels and all sorts. <laughs> it's from that place of imagination, though. That's that's the other thing. It's so powerful. Our imagination, our creatress energy. This is how we ground the castles in the sky. It all comes back to the imagination. This is why they want us, they want us dumbed down. So I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah. Amazing. So just keep that creative energy flowing. And um, I know that people that are going to be tuning in, that are listening to this podcast, will definitely be looking out for your work. Check out Emma's links below. I'm going to drop them down below here. Emma, thank you so much for coming on. It's been amazing to have you. And I'm it's, sure we'll we'll stay connected. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. I've had a lovely, lovely time. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Okay, bye bye. Bye.